Welcome everyone to another date on Kubernetes Meetup. It is an absolute pleasure to be here with you today. My name is Bart Farrell and I have the good fortune of being the leader of this amazing community full of fantastic people from all over the world working to share knowledge, show folks how to run data properly on Kubernetes, what are the best ways to do things, the best ways not to do things. Um, if we can get the links on the screen, just always a reminder, we are on LinkedIn, we are on Twitter, we are on Slack. I was having a very interesting conversation with Karthik earlier today in Slack. We will be continuing that conversation with the questions that we get during, during the meetup. As always, if you have questions, you can, you can ask them directly in the chat, or you can also feel free to jump in in our Slack. And like I said, we're always willing to, to continue the conversation there. A couple of announcements before we get started. Major announcement. Um, Gorka, can you share my screen because I'm incapable? I have a wonderful technical director who you cannot see. His name is Gorka and he's incredible. Um, so we are very happy to announce that from the data on Kubernetes community, um, you can, yep, can you go to the first one, Gorka, from the CNCF? Can you scroll up just a tiny bit? Very, very good. As you can see, we have the data on Kubernetes day, all right, data on Kubernetes community day, which is being hosted by the CNCF. Very happy to be in, involved more directly with the CNCF. Um, Karthik knows a lot about the CNCF as well, too, because Litmus Chaos is a sandbox project in the CNCF. So we'll definitely be hearing a little bit about that later. You were just mentioning some things about KubeCon in 2018. Oh, do we all miss events in person? Um, but for the time being, on May 3rd, we will be having a co-located event in KubeCon, Cloud Native Con, um, EU 2021. It is totally free to sign up. You can either sign up through the KubeCon registration if you already signed up for KubeCon. If you are not, you can contact us directly. We will get you on a waiting list. There will be access for everybody. Everybody who wants to attend can attend. Um, Gorka, can you go to the other webpage? If you go to our webpage, dok.community, you can see the provisional schedule and lineup, right? With the different speakers that we're going to be having. Um, so far, I've got speakers from KubeSphere, from Datastax, from MyData, from Flipkart. We've got end user talks. Um, we're going to have a bunch of different stuff going on. It's going to be a very, very packed day. So lots of things happening there. We still have a call for papers open for end user talks. So if you have an end user talk that you'd like to give, just uh, you can get either information on the website or you can just contact me directly, right? So like I said, as you can see in the schedule, there are still some, still some gaps for end user talks. So we'd like to, to get some more folks out there that can give those real use cases of where we see data on Kubernetes on the ground, right? Um, so that being said, like I said, those are our major announcements. As always, you can check out our meetup page. We've got tons of meetups planned for the next few weeks. I have to say that personally, this is going to be my first chaos engineering meetup to be participating in, leading, we could say. Um, we can stop sharing my screen, Gorka, if you don't mind. Thank you. Um, so very happy to be introducing Karthik. Karthik is no stranger to chaos engineering. As I was saying earlier, before we got started, I think it's pretty much impossible to talk about chaos engineering, not talk about Netflix. We're going to be talking about a lot of other things as well, of course. Um, but Karthik has been working with chaos engineering, you were saying, for at least last uh, last few years. Um, but Karthik, before we get started, can we just find out a little bit about you and, and find out a little bit about, you know, how you got in this world of chaos engineering and what are the things we can expect to hear about today? Awesome. Uh, thanks, Bert, for uh, giving me this opportunity to present at uh, the DOKC meetup today. So, hi, everyone. Um, I'm Karthik. I work for uh, an organization called Chaos Native was uh, spun off from my data recently. I also maintain um, the open source project called Litmus Chaos, which is a cloud native chaos engineering project. It's a sandbox project in CNCF. And um, like Bert mentioned, I've been uh, doing chaos engineering for the past uh, three, four years now. It's been an amazing journey. Uh, we started this Litmus project because we wanted to do chaos testing for OpenEBS, which is another uh, sandbox project around containerized storage. And over a period of time, we thought it's going to be useful for a lot of other folks, uh, stateful or stateless, different kinds of applications. And we made it more generic and uh, it's uh, now evolved into its own uh, project with a separate roadmap. And um, today we'll talk about um, what is cloud native chaos engineering? What is this prefix called cloud native? To chaos engineering. I think chaos engineering has been around for quite some time. Uh, like what mentioned, Netflix really coined that term. It's been around for more than a decade, I think, now or so. And uh, a lot of people have been practicing it, but there has been an increase in adoption of chaos uh, engineering practices over the last few years, um, especially with the onset of the cloud native paradigm and Kubernetes. So we'll talk about what is cloud native chaos engineering and how Litmus enables you to do that. 
we'll uh, do a couple of quick demos, uh, both on stateful applications um, where data is involved, just to show what kind of hypothesis you can build around your experiments, how you can use litmus to do those, inject those faults, and what you can basically do with it. So that's the agenda for today. Uh, and I'm happy to take questions and just discuss anything chaos around. Perfect. Well, that being said, I think we can jump right in. Karthik, go for it. And just a reminder to everyone in the audience, if you have questions, put them in the chat, or if not, feel free to jump in our Slack. If we don't get to the questions in, in the hour that we have for today, we can definitely continue the conversation later. I have to say that Karthik is very quick at answering questions, gives very nice full answers, so don't be afraid to ask. Um, but if you want to go ahead and share your screen, go for it. Yep. Uh, let me share my screen. Okay. I hope uh, the screen is visible. Yes. Great. So this is the agenda. We'll just talk about chaos engineering for a second, and then uh, delve into what's cloud native chaos engineering. Then we'll talk about Litmus, the project. Then we'll do a couple of quick demos on uh, stateful applications. I'll explain what the scenarios are, and then we'll do the demo. So I think chaos engineering, um, a lot of us might already be aware of what it is. Um, and this being the season of uh, pandemics, hopefully we all uh, have taken the vaccine and are getting better. It's, it is like vaccination. So you don't want production outages to happen because outages can cost a lot of money. We were just having um, a, a conversation on the DOKC Slack channel where uh, we were discussing how much downtime can cost. There's been a recent uh, Gartner report which said that um, a minute of downtime in mid-sized organizations can also cost more than $9,000 uh, worth amount. So it's, it is costly. And uh, we really don't want to see outages in production. If there is something that we anticipate, uh, then it's better to check it out even before you go there, even before it happens uh, unannounced. So you go ahead and inject controlled failures in uh, your pre-prod environments, or if you're pretty confident, then even on your production environments, and then see what is happening in your system and uh, have a hypothesis around how your system should behave and check whether that hypothesis is true, whether it is validated or if it is not, then it's uh, probably time to go back to the drawing board, fix your business applications, your services, or maybe the infrastructure on top of which you've deployed your services. And uh, it's something that needs to be done on a continuous basis. It's not some one-off thing. So uh, chaos engineering has picked up in importance over the last few years. We'll talk about that evolution going ahead. So uh, there was this notion that chaos is something that has to be done in production. So there was this movement of shifting right and testing in production because you really don't get that kind of an environment uh, in your pre-production or your staging clusters. The amount of traffic, the amount of density that you have uh, in terms of the number of services and dependencies that you have on production is generally not replicated in pre-prod environments. So there was this notion that you always test in prod. As far as chaos goes, you inject controlled failures in the form of game days. So game day is an event where you come together to test out a specific controlled fault. You have all the stakeholders in one place. You identify the mitigation plans, rollback plans, and then you alert your consumers. And then you go ahead and do this test and observe the results and then go back and work on it. That used to be the mode of doing chaos engineering for a long time. But um, with the onset of the cloud native uh, paradigm with uh, Kubernetes being the development platform as well as the deployment platform of choice, there are a lot of organizations that are trying to migrate uh, their services onto Kubernetes. So uh, it's a platform that a lot of people want to test out beforehand before they move their services and before they run their applications in production on Kubernetes. So this migration activity has caused a spike in the adoption of chaos engineering. People want to test how their applications behave on Kubernetes um, with significant load. They try to mimic production environments and they try to inject a lot of faults and they see what happened. And based on the results and outcome, they move um, slowly their applications onto Kubernetes in production. So this has, in a way, democratized uh, chaos engineering, I would say, because it was in the 
domain of experts before, but uh, maybe it could be SRD teams or ops teams that were doing chaos engineering. But now um, developers also had started taking a look at chaos. There might be service owners uh, who are testing their uh, applications on staging clusters. They're doing a lot of chaos there. And uh, that's how chaos engineering, both at a practice level and at a personal level, is uh, getting uh, more and more used. So chaos engineering, like I said, is, was being typically done, typically being done as game days. It wasn't really integrated to CI pipelines and observability used to be more of a manual thing. Chaos without observability is, uh, is not a good thing. It's like searching for a dark cat, black cat in a dark room. You need to know what's exactly happening when you inject faults, how your infra or application is behaving. So observability is a must. But oftentimes uh, in the past, the way chaos was done is there was a hands-on live um, observer of what's happening in your experiment. And you're looking at dashboards intently uh, trying and seeing what's happening. But um, it's something that needs to be automated as well. Your observability, uh, the validation that you would do as a, a person, as an experimenter, looking at the system live is something that you also want to bring back to your automation. And um, you can also see here that there used to be a lot of uh, manual planning. There used to be a lot of uh, process around it. That continues to be the case. The process is always a good thing, but um, in recent times, the chaos engineering is uh, uh, being done a little differently. Uh, we, we'll talk about that. Before we come to how it's being done in the recent times, and that is what we call cloud native chaos engineering. Uh, this is a diagram that shows you how uh, Kubernetes has crossed the chasm. Um, a lot of folks are picking it up. It's crossed the early majority, whereas chaos engineering is still there. It's uh, still with the early adopters. It's not become mainstream, despite the fact that it is seeing a lot of increased adoption, uh, especially large enterprises with a lot of legacy infrastructure um, and uh, who, who are running a lot of non-Kubernetes uh, environments are the ones that are probably are still not taking up chaos engineering to that great extent. Um, whereas you will see a lot of uh, adoption in the Kubernetes world. That also explains the uh, proliferation of a lot of tools in the Kubernetes chaos engineering space in the recent times. Having said that, this does not mean that the uh, legacy organizations, I mean, the organizations using legacy infrastructure is not using chaos. They're still doing it. People who have uh, uh, put their services on the cloud uh, are, are using uh, chaos tools to go ahead and inflict chaos on the cloud services. Uh, chaos Monkey from Netflix is a popular example. There are other projects as well. And, um, and the vice versa is also true. That is, when you're doing cloud native chaos engineering and Kubernetes, it does not mean that you restrict your chaos only to Kubernetes based microservices. You also inject chaos on what you consider as non-Kubernetes entities, the infra entities like cloud services, or even your bare metal machines for that matter. Just the approach and way of doing it is become cloud native, but your uh, target objects of chaos have become more hybrid in nature. And this diagram basically shows you that chaos engineering is still in the early adoption phase. So what exactly is cloud native chaos engineering? Why are we harping over the term so much? Um, so this is a subcategory within chaos engineering that um, a few of us from Maya data and now chaos native helped coin. And uh, the CNCF also published a blog that carried this message of what is cloud native chaos engineering. I will share that uh, blog probably at the end of this webinar. So one of the things um, when we when we started as an open ABS team, when we started looking at ways to test it, uh, we were not looking at uh, using the tools or the approach for chaos just within the team. We wanted the users of open ABS to uh, try it as well. So if you are a user of the open ABS platform, you run your chaos uh, in your own environments with OpenEBS in it to see how it performs. So we just wanted that validation to be extended to the user as well. And to that end, we wanted the users to have the same experience that they had while using OpenEBS. That is, everything is declarative, everything is a YAML, everything is a custom resource. 
and we wanted the same kind of uh, interfacing or same kind of user experience for the chaos uh, testing as well. And uh, until then, at that point, we really didn't find tools uh, which serve that purpose. So we came up with Litmus and we tried to build it around some principles that you see on this slide. We wanted to make it open source. Of course, that's a no brainer because a lot of uh, folks in the community uh, writing different kinds of applications have different ideas of chaos. So it's possible to create a rich repository of experiments only when it is coming from the community and it needs to be a collaborative effort. So we made it open source. And we also wanted people to be able to extend uh, the framework to um, orchestrate the chaos experiments that they might have already built. They might have built some custom uh, failures uh, testing scripts and we wanted the framework for chaos testing that we were writing to also be able to run those tests and not just the native experiments that were built in the new framework. We call it the bring your own chaos model, the BYOC uh, model of running chaos. And uh, for that, we wanted to have some open APIs. We wanted to have um, a common way of defining your chaos intent and then running it. And we felt that there's no better way than Kubernetes CRDs. The CRDs themselves are APIs. So we created some standards around um, how you can express chaos intent in YAMLs as Kubernetes custom resources and wrote up some operators to do the task that you want defined in the custom resources. So that's about the open API and lifecycle management of chaos resources on your cluster. And observability was another thing. Um, when you're doing chaos experiments live and you're looking at dashboards, that's great. But you also want to be able to factor in um, uh, what's happened in your system. When you're doing chaos experiments, you already you always have an idea of the steady state of your system and then the deviation that you expect in that steady state when you inject some faults. You want to be able to observe and record that data for use. So how do you do observability in chaos experimentation? So we wanted to create some standards around that and we also wanted to create some hooks um, for that. Not only uh, should you be able to um, receive observability information from your ecosystem and factor that in for hypothesis validation, but you should also be generating some uh, observability uh, metrics yourself. You should be able to uh, uh, generate some metrics or logs or alerts uh, or any other observability artifact uh, for people to consume from the framework itself. So it works both ways, what you generate versus what you consume for the experimentation itself. So we wanted to do something around observability and uh, GitOps is uh, another popular um, uh, concept in the cloud native world. So everything is Git control, everything is um, run uh, via GitOps controllers, your applications are upgraded via uh, plugs or Argo CD or Keel, et cetera. We wanted to tie in uh, chaos to the uh, GitOps flow. So let's say you're upgrading your application on your cluster. You want to do some sanity checks. Uh, you want to inject some chaos and do some failures and see if the new version of your app, the upgraded app is really resilient. So we want we tied Litmus uh, or we tied some experiments to the uh, GitOps flow. So we have some microservices that track upgrade, updates to an application as caused by some of these GitOps controllers. And it notifies the uh, control plane to launch experiments on the updated app to see how the resiliency is. So these are some of the principles that we believe uh, were created because <clears throat> of the cloud native way of, of the world. And <clears throat> Litmus just got um, created from there. Um, the project itself is in CNCF Sandbox today. And we've applied for incubation and we're awaiting SIG and TOC uh, reviews. Uh, we have a good number of maintainers, um, uh, some folks from the Chaos Native Org, we have folks from Intuit and Amazon, and uh, contributions pouring in from Red Hat, um, Ericsson, etc. We have some call home metrics that have shown us that there have been more than uh, 200,000 experiment runs and a lot of uh, installations of the Chaos operator and uh, the adoption is uh, growing day by day, which shows in turn the um, increase in the uh, demand for chaos engineering and how people are looking at it. So that's about uh, chaos engineering, what is cloud native chaos engineering, how we defined it, and then a snapshot of the litmus project. 
I'll talk about uh, the litmus uh, components, how it works under the hood a little bit before diving onto the uh, demo. So uh, it comprises a helm chart. You could install the litmus uh, control plane using a helm chart or you have a Kubernetes uh, kubectl manifest, a YAML file that you can use. You have a public chaos hub. The chaos hub is like an open marketplace for chaos. Uh, this is where uh, we um, request developers to pick experiments from or contribute experiments into. And you can see the experiments are uh, categorized under some um, sections. The generic chaos experiments are most of the Kubernetes uh, um, faults are listed here. Uh, you can see the pod deletes or resource, ca resource chaos, network chaos, most of them at a pod or microservice level. They're all slotted under the generic experiments. It also has some node level experiments, uh, draining a node or uh, tainting it with some eviction taints to push all the pods out, et cetera. And then, then there are some experiments um, that belong to some other applications. So these uh, application specific chaos experiments internally use the same chaos libraries that the genetic experiments use, but they have additional checks, entry and exit checks that run as part of the experiment that are native to those applications. And we are in the process of building more applications, uh, more application specific as well as generic chaos experiments. And um, we should soon be seeing an increased number of experiments. So Litmus uh, can do chaos on uh, any kind of Kubernetes, um, whether it's on the cloud or whether it's bare metal, et cetera. So the typical architecture is like this. The Litmus control plane consists of the portal it has a front-end uh, web UI, uh, a GraphQL-based server, and a MongoDB to store the state. And um, this can execute chaos on different clusters, the same cluster where the portal is installed, or other clusters that are added as chaos targets to the portal. So there will be some agents that get created on these uh, targets. And um, the unit of execution of chaos experiments in these clusters is using what we call chaos workflow. I'll show you that in a bit. It is a play on um, Argo workflow and Litmus. I'll explain what that is in a bit. So you can do chaos on uh, other clusters as well. And uh, your chaos can be against uh, Kubernetes microservices, your pods and your deployments, daemon sets, stateful sets, or it can be against um, some of the cloud services. Uh, that's the infrastructure on top of which you've created your cluster. It could be killing of an EC2 instance or detaching an EBS disk or a GPD disk or taking down an Azure instance, etc. So uh, the portal serves as a cross cloud control plane. And we have some uh, event exporters and metrics exporters that run uh, as, along with your litmus agents. And um, they expose some information around your experiments. As you do your chaos, it gives you a lot of information around what's happening through metrics. So I talked about chaos workflow being uh, a play between uh, chaos experiments and Argo workflows. We call them chaos workflows. So we chose this to be the unit of execution of chaos because we had this request from the community that said, doing experiments is fine, but I want to um, string together multiple faults in some order, maybe in some sequence or maybe in parallel, or I want to do chaos injection, fault injection along with some benchmark load that I'm running against my application at the same time to simulate real world conditions. So we felt Argo workflows are a very good way to achieve this kind of ordering and sequencing. So you could embed the chaos resources or manifests into an Argo workflow. And then we use some um, images within this workflow that understand the Litmus API. And uh, they are used to consolidate the status and um, results and they influence the success of a workflow. So that's what we call chaos workflows. And on your clusters, when your uh, workflows are executed, we create uh, some chaos specific resources. So these are the resources that Litmus initially built, which we call as the chaos custom resources. So these are the uh, custom resources. There's a chaos experiment, which is something that you can pull from the chaos hub. It is a static uh, template like CR and it is pre-built. And uh, you have one chaos experiment CR corresponding to one fault. So you have a pod delete 
chaos experiment you have a pod network loss chaos experiment you have a disk fill chaos experiment etc so it contains a granular definition of your um, chaos intent and uh, about exactly what are the uh, artifacts associated with it what image runs this experiment what are necessary permissions to run the experiment etc chaos engine is user defined and this is the main one a user interacts with and this is also the one that a user would really be influencing when he constructs when he or she constructs the workflows and this is the one that binds uh, an application instance on your cluster with a specific chaos experiment and also defines a lot of run characteristics so which is called the hub then there's a runtime um, chaos uh, resource that gets created called chaos result which holds information about the state of your experiment and the verdict of your experiment and the results of the individual um, steady state checks that you burned in into the experiment i'll show you how this looks and there's also a few auxiliary crs around uh, repeating your experiments with a uh, scheduling schema etc so on your cluster typically this is what happens your workflow has an embedded chaos engine that gets launched and the chaos operator watches for this and creates some jobs so the the litmus chaos experiments run as kubernetes jobs so when these jobs run they inject the chaos on the chaos target it could be a microservice on the cluster or it could be a, a cloud service and uh, it generates a chaos result depending upon how the experiment went and you have the exporters um, exposing the right metrics when you do this so this is how your um, experiment actually runs and uh, there are different kinds of experiments um, i showed you the chaos hub with its categorization so these are the different experiments and more experiments are coming and then we have some observability um, information that result in chaos interleaved graphs we, we call this as chaos interleaved grafana dashboards so you can see this red area here which is essentially the period when the chaos was active and you can um uh, get this as litmus uh, annotations on your dashboards and you can see how the application behaves there's also some probes that we use to actually uh, consume or verify metrics in your cluster and see whether this is in tune with your expectation around how an app should behave we'll talk about that during the demo but uh, this is about a very quick um overview of litmus and we also integrate with different uh, ci tools um uh, like ci cd tools like spinnaker gitlab um, github actions captain captain is another uh, sandbox project in cncf so we have a control plane plugin for captain uh, and you can run litmus experiments as part of your ci cd as well so this happens uh, this is the um, new evolution in in the chaos world people running experiments continuously Uh, this is the chaos first principle that we also talked about in slack people are trying to run chaos as part of their uh, ci cd pipelines they run it in an automated way and um, they have their steady state checks validated as part of these experiment runs in the pipelines uh, there are some um, uh, litmus artifacts that you can readily use if you are using one of these ci cd platforms and uh, that's available publicly on the uh, litmus uh, github so this it was a very quick snapshot i can take some questions um around uh, the litmus project or the philosophy behind uh, cloud native chaos engineering or litmus and uh, i'll move to the demo um, once we have had the discussion so i just have, have a question it? yeah i have a question here is that in in terms of organizations you know obviously i understand that you're someone who's very much working with this directly but once a company decides all right we're going to start going for chaos engineering in order for those tools and practices not to be only located in the small team of of, of chaos engineers what are good strategies to make sure that everyone in the organization is aware of it what are the profiles of, of folks that need to be involved who are the stakeholders who typically need to be participating in this from the beginning It's a great question. Um, I think we've seen some evolution in that um, over the last few years. It used to be the SREs and um, the ops engineers or the ops team, mm. and chaos used to be done on the clusters that were under their purview, so to say. It could be your um, so you could have different levels of staging clusters or different levels of pre-prod clusters, and then your actual prod, which the SREs would control. 
and then they would do chaos engineering as part of game days so they have um, a very specific target they have a very um, strict blast radius they've defined all that beforehand they have identified your impact and then they go ahead and talk to the um, uh, support your l1 l2 support just to be at hand if something is going to happen on those clusters and they also have uh, conversations with the um, the teams that they are interfacing with on the user side or the customer side where they tell them that we are going to do this experiment today just for resiliency testing purposes so you might see a potential impact but we are at hand to immediately resolve if something goes out of hand and um, it, it can go uh, to the extent of your um, your enterprise support vp they could get involved and carry out those game days that's how it used to be done but, but over a period of time uh, there's been a shift left in chaos so not only the sres and ops folks uh, and support folks uh, engaged in this but you also have developers are doing this so the developers are of different kinds you have the actual app developers writing the business logic for your applications and you have the devops engineers who are actually taking care of your pipelines your build infrastructure your um, dev clusters etc so these folks are also getting involved today because chaos engineering is becoming more ubiquitous it's being done in different phases of your uh, development pipelines in fact um, there have been some cases where the application developers do it as part of dev test on their local clusters um the experiments might not be at of the same range or blast radius or impact as you would do them on a large scale cluster but they're still engaging in some kind of failure testing um in their own environments and uh, we have integrated with uh, a project called octeto um ah, which yes. Yes. has i think ramiro has been on the do yes season. ramiro has been and ramiro will be back uh, so anyway yes we know octeto very well yep so we we do have uh, some users in the octeto platform that um have a single click deployment of litmus and they use it to test um, the applications that they are testing uh, using the octeto platform so it's uh, it's becoming um, more democratic like i said everyone from the developers to the sres are using it with all the devops folks and build and release engineers getting into the act and it's and it has been traditionally a uh, uh, much loved thing for qa folks um, so people actually use these tools for um, doing a lot of uh, freestyle manual uh, exploratory testing um, where they inject some chaos so qa teams are also looking at chaos so these are the folks who are actually doing it okay good and then we have a question um you mentioned that it is common it's a common use case to inject chaos into hybrid infrastructure both kubernetes clusters and bare metal nodes i didn't understand how litmus chaos works on the bare metal uh, cases since it can't have chaos operator or crds for those the great question uh, shivansh so like i mentioned uh, here um your chaos uh, portal can be on kubernetes but the targets that uh, it's going to do chaos on or the subjects of your chaos can still be other services uh, it could be a bare metal machine or cloud services this is something that evolving and developing so when you create a cr you could actually uh, specify what is the action or the um, chaos step that you're going to do let's say you're going to do a node restart and i want to go ahead and um, just run a shutdown command on a linux box that should work even on a bare metal system or you could be doing something on your vms if you have an es6 environment vmware uh, machines then you actually make use of the vsphere api vcenter api to go ahead and kill those uh, vms or detach the data stores etc that is something you can define in an experiment so the litmus chaos experiment um, is structured in a way that allows you to define what you want to do for example let me just take a look at the uh, node restart experiment so if you look at the chaos experiment definition for this particular uh, case um it actually tells you that um i'm going to do a restart and the experiment here is actually going and doing a shutdown command or a power off command and the business logic for that is going to run out of an image like this and you need to be providing some information for you to be able to do those commands like you need to be providing 
your SSH details, and uh, you should have the permission to be able to um, uh, go ahead and run that command on your nodes. Uh, so you can launch some pod on the node that you want killed, and then you could mount the right directories, run with run that pod with the right capabilities, and then go and execute that shell command. So this is a very very basic. Uh, way of uh, doing chaos on bare metal. There may be more nuanced ways of making use of IPMI APIs or um, the um, VM APIs, etc., for you to be able to act on bare metal. And similar story goes for the cloud as well. The steps for the experiment can be defined and uh, bound into your experiment, and that experiment is then converted into a CR. And that CR is then uh, operated against or reconciled by your chaos operator. So you could create pods onto your bare metal infrastructure. And once it gets created there, it does some job that impacts that particular node or the pods running there, et cetera. I hope that answers your question. Shivansh, are you satisfied? I hope so. I think it was a good answer. All right. Anyway, keep going. Good. Yes, he's happy. Very good. Awesome. Okay, and so um, there are a couple of quick uh, demos. Um, the first one is about um, uh, Percona. So I have uh, the litmus portal already installed just in the interest of time. And um, the installation step is uh, pretty simple. Um, I have a Helm chart that is installed the portal and I have Chaos target, which is the, the same cluster we have, where I have the portal installed. So it's called as a, a self cluster. And um, I have the Chaos Hub embedded into my um, uh, portal. So you can actually construct new workflows by selecting experiments of the public Chaos Hub. Or you could connect your own private Chaos Hubs in case you have some experiments uh, that are private. So uh, I have a couple of experiments. And uh, I'll explain what the use case is. So we did this uh, in a boot camp in the recent Chaos Carnival. Uh, you could take the take a look at the source in case you're interested here. So we have a Percona Galera cluster. So this is a cluster that is um, a multi-master MySQL cluster based on the extra DB uh, distribution of, of Percona. And um, it is actually uh, running three Percona nodes and um, it uses the open EBS local PV as the storage um, substrate. So we are going to launch some sysbench workload. I'm going to launch a sysbench client just to pull push some load onto my um, MySQL. And um, I'm going to go ahead and inject some network loss between the peers of your uh, Percona cluster. So I'm going to have uh, the Percona uh, uh, pod one uh, be distanced from or lose the network uh, or uh, stop the communication of the Percona pod one with pod zero and pod two, its peers. And uh, we'll see what happens uh, when we do that. Uh, there is a particular um, parameter in Percona called EVS suspect timeout which actually it has a timeout of five seconds. If one of your nodes peers is going to be inaccessible for more than uh, that period, it actually pushes it out of your cluster. And um, then you'll have to reconnect into your cluster. Data has to be uh, redistributed, not exactly redistributed, but you will be able to take writes and you will be able to sync uh, with the rest of the peers after you um, ensure that you join back the cluster. We will run this in two cases, once with three seconds, where one of the uh, peer Percona pods is just going to go off. Uh, there's going to be a transient failure. It's going to come back. The IO is going to continue seamlessly. There's going to be no uh, removal of that peer from your Percona cluster. And then another case where we have a longer timeout, there's going to be a loss of access to that peer for nearly around 20 seconds. And it's actually going to remove that node the quorum is going to get re-established. And then you have the um, a node coming back and joining and then resyncing. So we will see this happen. And this is important. We're talking about DOKC today and data on Kubernetes, a lot of stateful applications. Um, uh, there are a lot of apprehensions around running stateful applications on Kubernetes. 
but slowly that is um, uh, that is going away. There are a lot of good um, solutions that you can use, like Open EBS and a lot of other platforms, a lot of other storage solutions that you can use. And uh, you could use chaos engineering as a means to test what's happening when you create some loss on your application side, or maybe inject some loss on the Open EBS side to see whether it's resilient, to, be, to see whether your data is intact, whether your application is going to be sane. You want to know how quickly you are able to notify uh, a user about a possible issue, how much time you take to fix something if at all things went bad. All this can be identified by doing chaos experiments. They're pretty useful for stateful applications. So this is the hypothesis we have. Uh, with three seconds, I just expect my data to go on. With 20 seconds, the peer is going to go out and then rejoin the cluster. And I want to see my um, client, this is bench client, continue its IO without really um, timing out or breaking. So I have a Kubernetes um, cluster, this is EKS. And I have the Percona that um, you can actually see here. it running on the default namespace. The extra DB cluster is available here. I hope my uh, screen is visible and the font size is good enough. So you can see this pods that are running. Now I have just um, created a DB here. I'm just going to run an OLTP workload that's going to launch some traffic, right? And um, I'm going to go and use the litmus portal to run a custom workflow to inject the pod network loss. And I'm going to select the self cluster. I'm going to create my own workflow, which I have already on my workspace. I'm just going to upload a file. So I have the workflow for doing the three seconds um, uh, loss of network. So if you look at this workflow carefully, it has the installation of the experiment artifact as the first step. And as a second step, it creates the chaos engine. And if you look at the chaos engine, you can see that I have specified the duration of chaos. I have specified the type of network loss. So I'm going to uh, cause a 100% packet loss. I'm doing it on a cluster which has a Docker runtime. So I have specified some details around the uh, runtime. And I have targeted one of these pods, cluster one PXE one is the pod. And I have provided the IPs. I can even provide the host names uh, of the other two peer pods of the uh, Percona Aguilera cluster. And um, let me go ahead and run this. So I have the option of selecting the criticality or weightage for this experiment uh, in this workflow. So often workflows are run with multiple experiments. So you can give the weightage according to your need. I have only one experiment. So I've given all the uh, points to that. And I'm just going to schedule it once and schedule it now. And, uh, let me start the experiment. So you can actually see the experiment gets started. There is a workflow visualization graph that you can see here. It is going to tell you what step the uh, workflow is currently performing. And I have installed the dependency, the experiment artifact. Now uh, the chaos engine is getting created. You will see that um, here on the litmus namespace, you will have more uh, parts that get created signifying that the experiment is in progress. And uh, if you take a look at the logs of this bench, you will see that there was a minor blip here. There was no IO for three seconds, but it um, immediately resumed afterwards. Right, and um, this is what you can actually see on Grafana as well. So I have a Grafana dashboard. This is the, this is the PMM uh, dashboard that I'm using. And I've just instrumented with it with the litmus chaos annotations. You can see this, the cluster size remains the same. So there is no um, um, uh, ring deformation or quorum reestablishment here. And uh, the IO just went down for some time and then it is continuing here. So that's the hypothesis, uh, which proved to be true. Uh, just for illustration purposes, I'm showing you known behavior, but you could inject chaos and discover a lot of new things in your applications as well. Uh, so the experiment is actually going to complete now. As you can see, this is uh, completed. You can get the logs of the experiment and you can see the chaos result here. Chaos result is the 
resource that tells you what happened. Um, this was in tune with my expectation. I got a passed verdict and I have not defined any probes here, uh, only the native probes or the default app checks to see whether the Parakana pods are alive is going to be run. So I've got 100% percentage. You can also see the logs of your experiment uh, from here. It's, uh, it's, a, it's a pretty simple run. So I can run the same experiment once again, and um, I want to uh, keep things clean, probably have less number of uh, clusters, uh, less number of pods on the uh, cluster when I show you. I'm just going to clean things up and run it once again, but that's not a, a mandatory step. And uh, you could, I also have um, the, I also have the lens set up here and um, you can see I have two part, two namespaces, um, default and litmus that are at play in this demo. Default consists of the, um, uh, the Perpana pods and uh, the litmus consists of the control plane of control and chaos plane of the litmus. All the microservices of litmus are available here. I'm going to do this experiment once again uh, with um, an increased duration. So let me run that very quickly. I'm going to create my own workflow. This time I'm going to select another one which essentially has a higher uh, duration for the loss. So you can uh, take a look at this. I have a duration that's uh, longer. It's say 60 seconds chaos duration. And I have the same 100% uh, packet loss. And um, yeah, this was the duration. Let me increase it. So you can override ENVs that you have set in the experiment. On an instance basis, the chaos engine overrides what you've set inside the chaos experiment CR. So I'm going to run it for 20 seconds. And uh, this time I'm going to do it on the same part with the same destination. So let me go ahead with this. All right, so now you're going to see the um, new workflow getting instantiated with a different parameter different um, chaos duration period. And if you take a look at what happens here, you're actually going to see um, chaos being um, stopped for five seconds after which the IO should resume because um, you have the EVS timeout uh, set up accordingly. Though we have set 20 seconds duration, you will have just five second worth of delay here before which uh, the other peers are going to take uh, over stuff. Yeah, you can see that here. And the Grafana is also going to show you that the cluster size is going to change. Um, so you have the cluster size coming down to two because <clears throat> the uh, pod was actually removed from the ring and then it's going to come back once again after you lift the uh, network loss after 20 seconds. And the, the dirty data is going to be synced and uh, you're going to have the multi-master um, capabilities uh, happening once again, you'll have synchronous writes happening after that. During this period, um, it's possible that your application that depends upon your cluster, your Galera cluster might actually be uh, finding issues. So it might have a very touchy timeout. Uh, so you might want to be testing those things, how your end application is behaving uh, to these kind of uh, uh, chaos. This was about a very quick demo on uh, Parkona. And the other use case was on Kafka, which is again, a, a stateful application. So the use case in this uh, scenario is something like this. Let me um, explain that. So I have um, a, a Kafka um, stateful set with multiple brokers. I have three brokers here. And I want to check if the um, message timeout that I have set for my uh, message queue is good enough. So the Kafka here is using the uh, EBS storage. It's using the native uh, AWS EBS storage. And um, I, have, um, uh, I, I have created, or I am going to create as part of the experiment, uh, some test load. So this load is going to be uh, run as a pod. So I'm going to run a simple message stream with just a hello uh, string and a timestamp. I'm going to have one producer and one consumer container as part of this pod. And the consumer is going to be configured with a message timeout, which I believe is good enough 
for this particular cluster and the environment I'm using in this cluster, the CNI plugins and the storage, etc. The message stream is going to have just one topic and one partition for the topic. And we are going to replicate that partition across the different brokers. And uh, we are going to identify the leader partition, the partition leader uh, for this particular uh, partition. We're going to identify which of these brokers happens to be the partition leader. We're going to kill it. We're going to do a pod delete experiment. And this broker is going to go down and it's going to trigger a failover. Uh, the other broker is going to take a partition leadership duties. And the broker that gets killed might just be a partition leader or it could be the controller broker as well, the one that's orchestrating these failovers. So you could have a longer time for failovers to happen. And um, I want to see whether my message queue goes on unbroken or whether it times out, whether my message timeout that I've set to the consumer is good enough or no. So these are the things I'm hypothesizing about. So that is the next demo that um, I'm going to show. And I've got a standard JMX based uh, Kafka exporter here, uh, a Kafka dashboard here. I've got the JMX exporter and um, this is showing you the broker count. It is showing you what are the messages uh, at this point, et cetera, whether there are any under replicated partitions, so on and so forth. So let me go ahead and run that workflow and see, we'll see what happens. So let me select the cluster. Uh, I'm going to follow the same process. I'm going to upload my own workflow. And I'm going to select um, a different uh, uh, workflow here. I call it the CNCF meetup.yaml. And you can see the workflow here. It has some slightly different attributes. So you can see that um, I'm targeting the Kafka stateful set. This is the application information, the information of uh, the application that I want to target. This is how you specify blast radius. And uh, then I map this application against the Kafka broker pod failure experiment. And I have provided all the details of the Kafka service in order to do service discovery and do health checks. And I have a message uh, timeout of 60 seconds for this case. So these are the uh, properties with which I'm running this uh, experiment. But more interestingly, you'll also see uh, these um, probes. So I have some Prometheus probes here. So this is a way for me to define what is my hypothesis against the steady state? I don't want to have under replicated partitions at the beginning and end of the experiment, something that I am uh, trying to achieve by setting the mode of these probes as edge. Edge indicates the beginning and the end of chaos. And I'm going to see that there should be no under replicated partitions. I should leave all the brokers in sane state and I should have um, a clean setup before I begin and after I end the experiment. But um, we will have some unreplicated partitions in between while we actually do the chaos because we're taking one of the brokers down. But I should not have any offline partitions. I should not have data unavailability. So I'm checking this uh, using another Prometheus metric called offline partition count. And I'm checking it continuously throughout the experiment, uh, the beginning through the chaos period and after. And I also have the main premise uh, the main check that I'm doing called message stream continuity check. So here I ensure that my Kafka consumer is always in ready state. That is the message stream should be unbroken. If it fails, then this term, this continuity is going to get terminated. So I'm going to do this for a mode called on chaos because we're going to be launching this load pod just before chaos. So uh, we're going to do this um, only for the chaos duration. So this is how I can specify different probes and validate my um, steady state hypothesis. So now that I've got um, this workflow, let me go ahead and execute it. And this is also that uh, something that I'm going to execute just once right now. And uh, this will trigger the experiment. Same uh, procedure here. It's going to pull the experiment from the chaos hub and install it. And then it's going to create the chaos engine to trigger the chaos. You can see that happening in the Kafka namespace. So let me un unselect default and select only Kafka. So one of these Kafka broker parts is going to go down shortly. So you will see new parts uh, coming up in the litmus namespace. You're going to have a, a Kafka broker part failure um, part that's going to come up. Let me show that on the terminal as well.
you'll have a Kafka broker pod experiment uh, that gets uh, created. So this pod is going to be running. And uh, the first thing that you will see is it's going to create a load pod. We call it as the Kafka liveness pod. So that's the one containing the um, uh, uh, producer and consumer containers. And that's the one that carries out your message queue. And once that is launched, yeah, this is the one. And once this is launched, you're actually going to identify the partition leader and then we are going to kill one of these Kafka broker parts. So you can actually see the Kafka consumer logs at this point. You will see um, the message queue here. Yeah, this is the string and this is the timestamp. It's a very simple one. And it's actually going to kill one of these uh, Kafka brokers. In this case, it happens to be Kafka 1. You can see the pending state here. So that is the broker that's actually going down. And you can see the action on uh, Grafana as well. So let me uh, just show that here. The Kafka cluster summary is actually showing you um, that one of these broker pods is uh, going down. This is just a refreshing. That's mostly due to my um, slow internet. So that should show you soon. I'll probably bring that up when it comes up. You can see this uh, part is actually going to come, go down and then come up. It has a readiness probe defined and uh, it's going to take some time before it actually becomes active. There's an init delay seconds of around 60 seconds here. In that period, you can see the message queue is still uh, continuing unbroken because the other parts have actually taken over. So this is um, uh, a check against Kafka. And if you had a different storage provider, or if you had a different network plugin, probably the message timeout would need to have been tuned accordingly. And um, you will see the, uh, the chaos uh, workflows. Yeah, you can see that here. One of these brokers has gone down and it's going to come up soon. There will be some under-replicated partitions as signified by this red area here. And uh, you can also see that there are no offline partitions. That's the check that we want to do. So you can actually see offline partitions in one of these places below. Yeah, then there are no offline partitions here. And um, eventually your uh, uh, broker is going to recover. So the uh, portal is going to perform these checks. The operator is going to perform these checks and that will get reflected on the portal and you will be able to see the chaos result and the logs, just like you saw in the, the Parkona case. So um, this was a very quick uh, demo, um, just to try to cover a couple of uh, experiments and a couple of different stateful applications in Parkona, Gorilla Cluster and Kafka uh, to show you how you can do this experiment. We've got a failure, which is actually a good thing. Um, that means one of our hypotheses happened to fail. Um, so which is something that needs to be looked at I probably need to go and check one of my deployment attributes. Awesome. So that's about the uh, demonstration. Um, are there any questions that I can take around what I just demoed um, or any questions around uh, fitness in general? Um, I think I, I, I had a couple other things I wanted to ask. I know we can keep, we can keep this going in Slack for sure. One of the things that I wanted to ask is that, you know, just you're a maintainer, right? Um, for folks out there in the CNCF ecosystem, you know, we, we often talk about contributor experience, about encouraging folks to get involved in a SIG, you know, it's just one hour a week. In the case of being a maintainer, uh, what's your time commitment like on that? Um, could you just repeat the last few? Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. yeah. How many hours a week do you have to spend uh, to be a maintainer? Okay. <laughs> it depends yeah. on the week. It depends on the week. But for folks out there who might be wondering, hey, maybe I could be a maintainer someday. What are the things that they should keep in mind? Yeah. Yeah. I think uh, one of the things I really love being a maintainer for, for, for starters uh, allows me to um, interact with a lot of folks and uh, create a positive impact in the community. One of the things we look forward to is um, having um, an active say uh, in things. So basically uh, we're looking at contributions to the litmus, either the core orchestration part or the chaos experiments or uh, the documentation or any one aspect of the project that you could uh, involve yourself into. 
Mm-hmm. So it's mostly, uh, I would say, um, uh, I, I end up spending at least uh, a couple of hours every day. Um, translates to around um, 10 hours a week. Maybe that can change depending upon the area of the project you're looking at. Of course. We have maintainers that are um, uh, looking at the documentation. There are maintainers looking at the deployment aspects of Litmus. How do we package it in different helm charts, etc.? Then there are um, lead, there, there's a concept of special interest groups in Litmus. We call it Litmus SIGs. So yep. we have a couple of operational SIGs in the in, in Litmus uh, documentation, Litmus observability, and a few um, uh, ones that are coming up around deployment and orchestration. So folks here get involved and talk about how the project can be improved in these areas. And they try to respond to user queries. They try to define the roadmap of what things can uh, come up. In the next, we do monthly releases. So what you can add as deliverables for that specific area or that um, SIG for the monthly release is something that one would discuss as a maintainer uh, along with, of course, uh, the contributions. So yeah, I, I would say depending upon the area of the project, once there is a governance policy that we have defined where uh, you could graduate into a maintainer uh, once you have a significant number of contributions. We are set to um, add some new maintainers, induct some new maintainers over the next uh, month or so. Um, folks have been contributing a lot of chaos experiments within chaos native and outside, folks from Red Hat, etc. So yeah, I uh, hope that answers. No, that's a perfect answer. That's very, very good. I think it's just interesting for people to see like, you know, how the progression works, how do you start getting involved in these kind of things? Um, so they know, you know, that these, these are the options that are out there. It doesn't mean that you have to jump into that commitment right away, um, but, that, but that it can be an option for folks that are interested. Um, now, that so being said- this uh, channel in- Okay, oh, okay, oh yeah, very, very good. So um, I'll, I'll probably share the link uh, of that, the, of the Slack channel on the meetup page, and feel free to join that yeah. and- um, most questions are, um, you, you'll get a fast response there and a lot of conversations going on. A lot of folks talking about what's working for them, what's not. And um, we do monthly community sync up calls. Um, so we have a public um, hack MD page um, that is uh, going to detail when these meetings happen. And you will be able to find uh, recordings of past meetings. Um, so you can uh, join our monthly community sync up and um, we, we will be uh, discussing the release that just went by. We will also be giving updates on the individual six. And um, we'll also be talking about what's happening in the community in general. There might be some cool demos uh, on the uh, uh, new implementations for that release, or some of the users might come in and share their story. So it's a, it's a happening place. So do join our community syntops as well. So that's one more place to learn about Litmus. Very, very good. Plenty of resources. You know the person to talk to. Um, wonderful team also as well, working at Chaos Native. Um, uh, Karthik, can I get you to not share your screen, to stop sharing your screen? Because we need to share our screen just before we finish. Perfect. Um, hold on one second. We have a, a tradition in, in our community that every time we have a meetup, we have a very special person who's in the audience who you can't see, um, our invisible man in the background, um, who creates an artistic representation of all the different things that we've been talking about um in in this hour and obviously there are a lot of different things that were covered um so let's take a look if we can we can see this um because i'm quite impressed with this one um in terms of other ones that we've had you should be able to see it soon because basically i think it's a pretty good summary of, of all the different points that are mentioned yep go for it if we can share our screen there we go so you can see our friend Acha was doing some graphic recording visual thinking um of the different points that were mentioned so we've got awesome. Karthik kind of as a chaos native captain. We're not going to say Captain America. We can say Captain Bangalore, Captain India, whatever you want. I think it's awesome. Uh, we see all the different elements that were kind of touched on there. Very, very thorough explanation. Nice to see a demo as well, too. And nice to see a demo that didn't work 100% according to the hypothesis. That's also nice, too. And I think, I think that transparency is great. And folks need to understand that this is just part of the process. Don't worry about it. Um, check it out afterwards and see and see what's going on there. Um, chaos engineering is a very, very interesting topic that I don't think is going to stop being interesting anytime soon. As long as we see the cost of these very expensive downtimes, these outages that don't just affect smaller companies, we're seeing that at the enterprise level, 
Um, I, I really think if you don't, you know, a basic, basic sort of, you know, saying that we have is that if you fail to plan, then plan to fail. Um, so it's always, it's always better to have these things in place. Um, I think, I think Carthy, you did a wonderful job. I hope folks out there know if you want to get involved, all you got to do is jump in the Kubernetes Slack. You can start conversations there. You can get help from the CNCF. Um, Litmus, Sandbox Project, definitely worth checking out. Karthik, thank you very much for your time um, and looking forward to have you back on the meetup sometime soon. Thanks, Bert. I think it was uh, great being on this meetup. Looking forward to future meetups on the OKC. Definitely. We'll see you in Slack. Take care. Bye-bye. <laughs>